Welcome to the Performance Formula with Jody Martin. Right, uh, Russell, I'm looking forward to this chat. Right, the first one went in on spirited cricket went pretty cool for me. Like, I think I think we're on a track between you and me, and I'm loving sort of our growth, our mutual growth out of these conversations. And I mean, we have lots of them offline that people on you know, not necessarily getting to hear and. There we get to share a little bit about our personal lives and things we go through and how this stuff is even relevant to us, right? And even though it's something like spirited cricket, um, where we think it's really about a game, at the end of the day, it speaks a lot to how we, how we are as human beings, you know? And, and essentially the spirit in which we do all things, not necessarily just cricket. Um, I remember us ending off our last conversation with you sort of, speaking and saying that we're wired for spirit, for the spirit of cricket and that sort of really stuck in my ears um you know and so i'm i'm wondering if we could start there in this conversation and then and take it from there hi jody yes thanks so much um i'm also uh, very much uh, excited about the prospect of what's to come um as the first one went so smoothly and so nicely um, I'm also remembering, as you just re referenced, the fact that this this game of cricket is such a a perfect metaphor of life. Like you're fading more than you're succeeding, those sorts of analogies. And I've always used to look and watch the game and find that the complexities that happen with inside the game, it's very much reflected in all areas of life. So therefore, that's the fascination, always a drawback. And hence, I love the fact that when we look at concepts as abstract, as the spirit of the game, it's almost like looking at the spirit of life in itself and how you're carrying yourself. So I just love the fact that you said that. It's a, it's a kind of an echo in my heart's cry of why I love the game yeah. so much. So I think even in saying that, um, I'm kind of answering what you're asking about how wiring, you know, we kind of wired to engage with life in this particular way. And I think similarly in terms of engaging with the game, the spirit actually allures or kind of woos us in, in such a manner. And I think it's something that we desperately want to have a uh, kind of sincerity on and we want to actually personify as best as we can. It's what is kind of our heartbeat for how we want the game to flow. But there are definitely distractors and there are definitely things that uh, lure us away from that uh, for the most part. And, and I think that's what I said the last time we would unpack today. And I think um, just as, a, as an intro in a way or as a starting point, for me, that centers around the concept of desire, right? When we build these desires, when we get a certain amount of a drive, uh, an appetite, a craving for whatever it might be, you know, ambition, whatever that word might be. But I think that's the thing that challenges um, our natural wiring, which is the spirit. And it kind of takes us away from it, and then it kind of draws us back. So it's this constant ebb and flow of getting, you know, getting lost a little bit and then getting found again through the spirit. And I think that's the beauty of how it works. It's, it happens like that in life as well as the game. So therefore, it's a perfect correlation. Yeah. This idea of desire, right? Um, when, you, when you say that, my head sort of goes to a cricketer wanting to be the leading run scorer or wants to enhance their career. And so I think what you're alluding to and you can correct me if I'm wrong here, but it's that idea that when we get involved with a game, when we, when we start playing, initially we might be drawn to it for the love of the game, but then as we go, as we progress in the game, there might come a time when you go, hang on, I can actually, I can actually make something of this. You know, I can become the best cricketer, the best footballer, the best swimmer, whatever it might be in my age group say first at my school and then it can progress to, oh shucks i am that you know okay well now i can maybe be the best in my area in my region or i i want to make a certain team and so slowly over time we sort of um get taught this idea that these desires are a good thing have you set your goals have you set them correctly are you setting smart goals and so we make this desire potentially primary we make that the focus you know have you written your goals down you've got to write them down got to map them out got to put the actions in there put the process goals in there so that you can achieve this thing achieve this desire where what i'm hearing you talk about is that 
that maybe that process, right, is not that healthy. You know, and I'm, I, I don't know if I'm on the right track here, so I'm happy that you bumped me in the right direction, but that's sort of where my head just went with it immediately there in the moment. Yeah, I, that's perfect, Jody. I think that's exactly what, what I'm insinuating is that often the, you know, these, these desires coming from a pure space, but they get tainted and tarnished in a way, or they misleading. They misguide us in a direction where we now, once the desires are put out there, almost as in a target to hit, these targets therefore now start dictating. And for the most part, they can lead us down a dark path because it's no longer the purity of why we've come into the game, what we played for, just the love of it, or just the, the, you know, the engagement with others and those sorts of things that we relish. It now becomes we need to accomplish this particular outcome for ourselves personally or as a team. It doesn't really matter. But that sort of dream or aspiration now becomes the cherished, um, you know, the Lord of the Rings type thing, the cherished little must-have. You know? And and it's my, my precious now becomes the driver. And as a result of it, this is when the last aspect of what we spoke about the last time, where it derails you without actually realizing. As pure a goal as it might be, let's say, as you said, of, you know, of, of people who are, are contractually bound when they became professional now, right? All of a sudden, their objective or their, you know, to maintain the standard of their contract, they need to perform. So now performance is the driver or the thing that keeps uh, the desire, that keeps the thing alive. So they're now bowing down to the, the, the necessity to hit that goal. But it can actually create a skewing or a darkness or a kind of a lament or pressure that can come with it. And hence, people feel that, right? So they lose that first love again of why they actually got to where they got to, you know? And for the most part, that's what we're talking about. We're talking about the fact that the spirit can actually rescue you from that space of darkness, that space of lostness, and bring you back. And you need to actually be brought back because you can't operate there. You're not wired to operate in that dark spaces because you become troublesome for yourself because though this inner conflict will torment you, but you'll also be tormenting or troublesome to others, the people that you relate to. And it will manifest through the game. It will show itself in situations where you don't really want it to, to show, right? These things that are happening on the inside of you. So that's where I'm saying desire in itself can definitely lead you astray. But desire, desire is not necessarily a bad thing. It's how you look to fulfill the desire and how you relate to desire and, and also the guidance and the uh, kind of partial openness you have for mentoring around that aspect. This is the work that we do, right? The, the aid of trying to help people to get things in the most healthiest fashion and the most easily accomplished fashion, right? Because as we said the last time, we are wired to accomplish this it's because we've got the natural gifting, but we don't want the, the sense of preciousness, the sense of desperateness, the sense of lack to be the driver. We want to flow like the grass always grows, the rain falls naturally. We don't have to force it. It just happens. Birds fly easily. You know, all those sorts of things. We should be flowing in it. So when desire is related to it in the spirited way, we are safeguarding ourselves from losing ourselves in a bad way without realizing it. And, and things therefore become sweatless and effortless. Yeah, I'm, I'm reminded of, um, you know, as you're speaking there, of uh, a mental performance concept that I was taught, right? The, the essence of our worth and our value as a human being and sort of who we think, you know, our identity versus the things we do. So self-esteem versus self-confidence um, is sort of the, the, the concept around which this plays. And a huge part of it is sort of this idea that at times, uh, so I, my sense is that the self-esteem part talks to the, it, it speaks to the spirit side, right? It's that sense of value that I carry within myself versus the self-confidence part uh, speaks to the performing part, the doing part. And so my sense is that from a mental point of view, that if we, if we, if we try and find our sense of worth or value in the, in the performance, that would be your, if I put it in your language, that would be the dark thing, right? That would, we find ourselves in this dark place because we're looking for a sense of our spirit 
in the things we do. And so we end up attaching these two ideas to each other. I am the things I do. And so they're not versus I am a phenomenal human being who can play a game and pursue things in a, in a certain spirit, in the, in the, I don't want to say the right spirit, but maybe a, a fitting spirit for what I'm going after. And then the things I do is sort of a natural uh, consequence of that rather than saying I have to do these things and that defines who I am. That 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 shows who I am. Um, I, I was also sort of uh, reminded of this. Um, I, I wonder what it was like, right? I wonder what it was like being a Chicago Cubs player for 116 years, not winning the World Series. The last time they'd won it was in 1900s or something, right? I don't know. I don't know the exact dates here. Maybe somebody can let us know in the comments below, but. 19 in the 1900s somewhere early 1900s and then the next time they won a world series was in 20 uh 2016 i think it was and so imagine for 100 years if if, if we go with this idea right the spirit versus our, the world to the wanting to win if for 116 years an organization has wanted to win wanted to win wanted to win i think that's tough it's tough for the supporters. It's tough for. I imagine all the abuse that got slung around and the bad things that were said about people and the, you know. And I I read a book about the sort of story about how they ended up winning. And my sense is a lot of what they introduced was they brought the humanness back. They brought, um, sort of selecting players based on their character, not so much just their just their ability so they wanted to know does your character fit with what we want in the organization not just in so in essence does your spirit fit does does what you're does what you bring to the table quite naturally fit with what we want to achieve as an organization and that became a primary criteria in how they selected their team so they weren't looking for um and maybe one example of that they were looking for people that were happy if the team won even if they didn't perform that was the criteria that they used and so that's a spirit thing right you're you're able to still show up and be good in the team and be good in the team environment even though you didn't perform and you're happy for those around you and so i don't know i feel like when we can separate these parts away from each other the desire and the the the, the di desire to achieve where at times we could experience a lack i'm not good enough i think that's what i sort of wanted to really escape about that is that i'm not good enough yet versus saying no i am good enough i have this within me i have the spirit i have all of this that i can give and i'm going to let this what's inside you flow into the outer world become a part of my performance become a, the way in which i engage with a game rather than trying to define my legacy or um, my status as a winner by by doing it. Yeah, I think um, Jody, I'm going to bring in a, something very philosophical in a way by, by what you shared there with that story about the Cubs. So the way I perceive that story, and I know you mentioned this before on the storyline about the Cubs, um, you know, I don't know any details, but I would suggest that they've been winning differently. There was a different win all over the years. Now, I know you're referring to they haven't won a championship. They haven't won the trophy. They haven't won in 100 years, as you said. But I felt like they, they, they through the process of not winning the silverware, they actually were accomplishing what the sweet spot is that they were aiming for, what they really ultimately needed. So philosophically, they won after 100 years, and they won more victories, in my view, because now they found this magic potion, if you want to call it that, or the recipe for success, that actually people can look back at their story and benefit from their story. Like, how do you not get victory for so many years, and then all of a sudden you do? What is it that turned this thing around? And is it something worth waiting that long for? And, and, and perhaps we weren't losing in the process of the striving. We were just discovering ways that doesn't work. Which means, you know, like the Edison example, I think it is, with the light bulb. Um, you said he wasn't failing after all those attempts of trying to get the light bulb. He was just discovering new ways that it doesn't work. 
So it's just a different framing, different way of looking at it. And I think philosophically, that's what it's about. When we strive for something, we actually just go back to the core of who we always were, which is this full, completely bubbling over, you know, this complete, we already have what we are seeking after. And we kind of circle back to that moment where we realize, oh my goodness, what I was pursuing is what I already am. Nothing really changed on the outside. Only the thing on the inside changed that I'm actually going off to something that I already is already here with me in the year and now, right? So that's the right. philosophical ang angle of it, right? But often these detours, if you want to call it that, you know, mental approaches um, that lead us down certain other avenues of, of, of this is how we're going to get the accomplishment over the line. Those things are all part of a journey of actually drawing us back to that sense of oneness, sense of completeness, sense of what you talk about, the esteem, so that we don't neglect the fact that those outside pursuits become redundant because we don't have that self-esteem established because that's where the real core essence of it is, the spirit of it is. That's where life stems from and will continue to give you life, but you can lose sight of it, right? You can actually surrender it or sabotage it by letting it go and not seeing it. So I personally think if you look at the mechanics and I want you to maybe delve into this because I know this is also an area where, where you've had a lot of insight into. But if you look at the mechanics of what desire does is where you cut into place and you have a goal or an aspiration or a target, um, you know, at the end of the season, this is what I want to achieve. What that does is, as you, I think you said it differently as well, it creates this gap or this disparity between where you are and where you'd like to get. And I think you use the word lack or not enough or not having, right? And I think that there is often what misleads, um, you know, people in terms of playing sport in a way where they have that aspiration and they don't need the target. Can you, for me, that sees that, if you can address that as a, as a different approach, that is where your magic lies, where your real peak performances can be manifested. Yeah. Yeah, 100%. I, I, I don't agree with that. I don't disagree with that at all. I think I like the idea that you sort of place it there because that's what happens, right? We create this goal at the end and say end of the season, by the end of this period of time. So we normally bind it by time. And hey, if you learn to set smart goals, the very last step there, the T is put a time to it, right? And personally, I'm not a big believer in smart goals. I don't think that you shouldn't set goals. I think you must be clear on them. But I don't know if that is the most effective way. I have found other ways to be a little bit more effective. But T is time bound. So I think as soon as you put time pressure on something, in certain domains, maybe that works. Maybe that can work in certain domains. But in sport, that is so fluid. I don't know if uh, setting a time-based target is is the best thing. By the end of the season, I must play for my country. By the end of the season, I must win a trophy. By the end of the season, when sometimes to win a trophy, and I think the Chicago Cup story is pretty valid in that, that um, they, they sort of, um, uh, the Chicago, sorry, I'm losing the, my, my thought here. The Chicago Cup story, as you said, that they learned a whole bunch of ways you know, not to win and so that they can find the sweet spot, right? And so I, I think when you set multiple year goals and you say, right, now I'm on this journey to achieving, say, something like that, and through the ebbs and the flows and the ups and the downs and the highs and the lows to learn all the ways to not do it so that I can learn to do it, I think you're setting yourself up in a slightly better way. But at the same point, if we talk about the spirit of cricket, then what you say so rightly is that's where that's where it derails is we we create this time based sort of thing and then now it becomes about that in that time and that's pressure and that's not achieving and that's the struggle at the end of the day. Yeah, the um the thing for me, the way it stands out for me is that uh often what happens is because of this gap that you create and uh between where you are and where you'd like to be, it automatically communicates to yourself that you don't already have. As I, as we constantly pointed out, you need to be that winner first, that essence of it, 
your own esteem. It needs to appeal to that first, right? And if you lose sight of that, you tend to now want to push yourself out of the year now, out of the zone, out of the present moment. And you keep wanting to say, only when I get that accomplishment, can I then feel like the thing that I'm saying I'm all about. And that desire there, it's like with appetite, right? If I can just backtrack slightly. If we have a craving or appetite, we constantly, we have maybe three meals a day, some less, obviously. But if we keep wanting to satisfy this as if it's never going to be or overeat or we don't just use it for proper nourishment, we're basically having a skewed approach at fulfilling something that's naturally there. It's naturally there because it's reminding you that you already have life in you and by taking in sustenance for its continued flow of life, right? Whereas it's not necessarily just consuming, 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 over-consuming, and then the body reflects that in a negative fashion, right? It manifests it in a negative fashion. So it's similar with desire. If you have desire, but you're trying to feed or uh, satisfy the desire in in a in a unhealthy fashion, it's going to back explode back on you in a sense, right? It's going to have a negative connotation to it. And I think that's why I suggested that, that the spirit keeps the purity there. It actually rescues you from losing your way. Like losing your way might be part of the journey, but it needs to be the spirit that can lead you back. And it does lead you back because it's a reminder, right? That you're going slightly off the rails and life can be re-engaged with right here and now, not there when you accomplish the goal and accomplish the outcome. And I see a lot of the time within, you know, if you watch sport, a lot of the times it is always only emphasized in the physical manifestation of the thing that we're pursuing. It's only there, not necessarily this drawing back to the contentedness of my already fulfilled nature, my really joy in the present moment and playing yeah. from that point of view. And that, yeah. that there is the sweet spot of the spirit um, that's at offer. And again, this type of conversations and languages, it's hardly, it's such a taboo, taboo thing amongst uh, professional spaces or just generally. It's not spoken about enough. It's not even given the option to consider as part of your arsenal in terms of peak performance. So our environments are not actually flourishing. It's not actually conducive for natural effortless peak performance because we're not even considering the spirit of the game in this manner. The spirit mm. of the game is linked directly to peak performance. Yeah, it's the essence of it, right? Well, that's yeah. how I'm understanding it at this point in time, how I make sense of it. Yeah, I'm I'm reminded of um I'm reminded of a lot of things in this conversation, it seems. You know, but uh, often, maybe let me say it like this. Often when I work with athletes, I I've come to realize that it, the core of it when you speak with enough of them, and I have been privileged to speak with international captains, uh first class cricketers, professionals across sports, uh, from swimming to football. And, and, and what I what I often find is that they, they, there's a way in which people are at their best. There's a way in which they do that, right? Um, and it's easy to make the way we would then often talk about something like a process, right? Like there's some process that's needed. And so it's easy to then make it about the performance, the doing of that thing, right? Like, okay, wake up, drink my drink like this, stretch like that, walk like this, talk like this, go hit balls like that, think like this, act like this. And so it's easy to turn performance into like a step-by-step -step little thing, right? So you become like a machine. You'll hear batters talk in cricket talk about their routine, or swimmer will talk about his pre swimming routine. And so it's, it becomes for me at times this very much checklisty type thing like I've got to check this list, check this list, check this list. And it's a very much focused on the doing, 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 doing. And so it's, it's quite natural. Like in a gym environment, you can measure how much weight the person lifts. So now we can measure, because we can measure it, we can improve it. That's a saying that happens in elite sport, right? If you can measure it, you can improve it. And so I think that's the, 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 the high performance type environments, they're very much driven towards that, right? They're driven towards this measuring, doing, because at the end of the season, we can put together a report that says our players improved this, their hamstring stretching got longer, 
if you want to go into that level of detail, you know, uh, batters averaged five runs more than they did last year. Footballers kicked more free kicks. We defended better, whatever it might be. Intended all the stats you can go and all that stuff is normally based around the doing, the the performance side. But if you speak with athletes and you get into like, what is it that actually gets them to perform? Like, what are the, like when they're at their best, what's busy happening, right? Not just what are they thinking, but what are they feeling? Like, what's that spirit essentially of that? So then you get into things that you wouldn't normally equate with high performance at times. You'd get into like, no, I don't really care about anything. <laughs> As an example, right? I don't, I don't really think much. But, and, and so I think when we come from the spirit, we open the door to that happening more. For us connecting with that part of our performance. And that is at times the struggle with mental performance or this conversation is that we can't measure it. It's not something that's so tangible. But it's very tangible for each individual. It's not something we can see. But it's definitely something you're aware of inside of yourself, your own personal feeling. Uh, I don't know if you used it in this conversation or if it was uh, as we're recording or if it was just before. Um, but you spoke about sabotage, right? That I find so many athletes struggle with this. They struggle with this idea of that desire that pulls on them. I want to step up. I want, I've got this dream or vision I'm carrying about in my life. And their daily experience of their journey with their sport is a struggle. It's a, like an inner battle. It's a battleground between that separation of where I want to be and where I am now. And so I think what I love about these, these conversations with you is that if we can make the spirit the path, then I think we reduce that inner struggle. We reduce that battle it's not going to take it away completely because we're not saying that the performance and the hard if we want to call it that is not important it is important it's what but it's the essence through which you do that it's the essence through which you guide yourself on that on the journey of the struggle essentially because struggle is all around us right the struggle is this is not to diminish that it's not but it doesn't have to be a battle with self and so the tangible i think really and hey, there are ways to measure, I think, the spirit or to measure the mental stuff. But they're not so um, they're not so tangible in that we can necessarily see them. It might be through putting out a survey on a weekly basis and asking very specific questions to athletes to see are we shifting as a group internally, um, which then relies on them knowing themselves and their self-awareness and things like that. So there are ways, but it's most organizations don't even do that. They don't even consider that side of things you know it's it's just the hard stuff um and so maybe just my final thought because this is where i start so all of this is in support of this idea that and we'll i'll also much probably say it again and again and you've mentioned it and i'll mention it again because it, to me it's so important is that it doesn't rain unless the conditions optimal conditions for rain is met like if if the optimal conditions are there for rain to fall Rain will fall. It has no choice. It's not like the, the little piece of moisture sits there in the clouds and says, nah, I don't want to do this. It just it happens, right? For, for, for a seed to grow from the soil, it can only grow from the soil if the optimal conditions for it is met. And it, or it'll grow if the conditions are met, but then it won't grow optimally. It'll grow sort of sporadically a little bit. Maybe it's not as thick as it needs to be or as robust as it needs to be. And so when the when there's a little bit of pressure that comes from the outside, it shakes us up and then the seed dies. But if the conditions are optimal, that seed will grow strong. The roots will grow deep. The leaves will be big. The uh, things will grow tall if it needs. It, it, it'll flourish in its best possible way. And I think a huge opportunity is missed from individuals, sporting organizations, because when we want to try and understand what makes us optimal, and these are all my words, right? For my stuff, my courses and my things, right? But if we can understand how to be optimal, like really optimal. And I want to say that it's very unique to each individual. It's not something you can get on an Instagram post or on, you know, the, the whole point of the, the journey is to find out what makes you the best that you can be. And so the, the spirit of the cricket angle or just the, 
I mean, we call it spirited cricket, but really it's the spirit, the essence with which you arrive to everything is the thing that's missing at times for most athletes because they so just process, 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 process versus, okay, what's the spirit in that process? What am I adding to it? What's the essence with which I'm doing this? And I think if we nail that a little bit more and a little bit better, that Performance can just happen because the optimal conditions for performance have been met. Sorry, I know that's a lot. That feels like a little bit of a rant. <laughs> no, it's it's perfect, Jody. I just needed you to, um, you know, to put everything out there so that we can paddle on it because it's given me a lot of thought as well. So there is a way, as you mentioned earlier, the all those measurements that you were talking about, right, in the pursuit of those goals. Uh, there is a way in the intangibles of the spirit. The spirit is symbolic or it's actually a synonym for relationships. You cannot have spirit without relationships. It's always interrelated. It's whether you're relating to the spirit of the game, it's an interrelational type of thing, or you're relating to the parties that are in the game, whether it's an umpire, match referee, or, or your opposition, your opponents. It's all of us, even the spectators, the crowd, the supporters, whatever, right? It's an interpersonal thing. So what spirit is reigning there, it's all about the relationships. How well are the relationships served by what you're doing, right? So if your internal, how you're relating to yourself too as well, by the way, the relationship you're having with yourself, that there is the essence of the starting point, right? Everything is from the inside. What is happening on the inside? Are those desires selfish, self-centered? And so, therefore, we tend to lean towards that, which is the dark side, right? And therefore, the sabotaging comes. So, the spirit, therefore, reminds you, hey, it's not only about you. It's not only about this accomplishment of your own self-interest here. We need to find a way, and the spirit helps you and rescues you from this narcissism of self, right? This ego maniac that you're actually developing and forming if you accomplish this goal, because you're going to turn into the precious, right? And you're going to actually manifest a choking of others around you in the pursuit of your own goals and your own accomplishments. And you're using the game to bolster your brand and ego and your accomplishment, right? Setting yourself up at the expense of another. So the way we measure spirit is in how well are you relating to the other? Because if you're relating extremely well and you're sacrificial or selfless, right? Then the spirit is reigning. It's accelerated because as you serve another, you serve yourself, the humble self, the mature self, the capital S, right? The collective self is benefiting and therefore the spirit is reigning and ruling, right? And therefore everyone wins. So that's the aspect of when peak performances happen and people tend to not want to back that. Like you said, we're measuring the small self, the ego self and how to keep enhancing the ego to be bigger at the expense of someone needs to then be a loser. But we can all win. There can be one person who wins the game, but we can all be winners because of our participation in it, right? There is that way to play it because we're considering the other. But when we approach certain things in an immature fashion, when we relegate the spirit and we only operate, how do I advantage myself over you? then it's a matter of me choking the life out of the potential of relationships flourishing with the aid of the game and still maximizing the talent potential of what you can do in the game. So the spirit really is a rescue. That essence of it, it's all about relationships and how to enhance and get the best out of each other without needing to push each other down to actually lift yourself up. In actual fact, uh -huh. you can both go up, right? And so often with, when you approach the desire, you try to meet the desire, which is pure, but it goes to the dark side and it becomes that self-centered, self-seeking at the, you know, win at all costs when you're pushing out against another, or how do I actually seem uh, better positioned than my opposition? Because that's what we're feeding on the daily. When we prepare, we're looking at plan A, plan B, plan C and saying, this guy's weak in this area. I'm going to take advantage or actually win thing over. So that sense of competition goes towards the dark side, right? So we tend to think no competition is part and parcel, but yes, but there can be a purer, more mature form of competition 
where we're saying skill for skill, let's battle it out and let the game win here. And we don't know who are going to be called crown champions because the ones who personify and preserve the relationship the most is going to be a hero with the cup, but also a hero internally because you felt like you've done it from a pure heart, from a pure essence, a pure spirit, not just, I've got one over you. So that for me is the real sabotage, the missing out on, because we know there's tons of examples in the game and I've experienced it personally. I think you've actually acknowledged this yourself uh, recently in, in terms of vulnerabilities, how we can, in the pursuit of going for an objective, we actually sabotage or we actually forego relationships in the process of that. Um, I have a sort of thought I want to add on to this that, you know, like as you were speaking, my, my head does these things, right? it creates these things. And so what it created there was the sense of, you, I, I was reminded of when I was sort of running my cricket academy in Joburg. This is the, this is where the thought came from. I struggled a lot with a very small area. Uh, there were like five cricket academies. Almost like none of us were um, there for each other. It was very much a competition between. In other words, I'm competing with you. I lose a kid to you. Uh, you know, that's a bad thing. I gained somebody from you. That's a good thing. And for a long period of time, that it bugged me. It bugged me a lot that we can't just find a way to like actually work together and lift everybody up in the process. Um, you know, and I'm sure people who know me from that time that I was a, a bit of an arsehole at time, right? Because I would, I, I wouldn't say I would be fighting these battles openly in public, but definitely behind the scenes, you would, you know, speak about things. We're speaking there about, you know, winning together and uplifting each other. Something that at that time I was battling with quite a lot, right? Is this idea of be better than, I want to be perceived that we've got something that you don't. And, if that's healthy, right? I've walked that journey. It wasn't a great experience. Um, sure, it might have feel great if we're doing well as an academy. You know, sure that feels great. It's short lived, right? So I'm I'm reminded of you always hear these stories of millionaires, uber successful people, uh, are depressed and unhappy and unfulfilled, and their lives are pointless. And so I think we programmed into a way in society that well the big house on top of the hill uh, winning a world cup uh, winning a tournament being the leading run scorer being the leading goal scorer um, outwitting your opponents that that is going to give you that sense it's going to give you that sense of achievement that's a sense of fulfillment not you you'll have the sense of achievement but that's short lasting it'll give you the sense of fulfillment we try and find our fulfillment in that it's it doesn't it doesn't it does it fulfillment does not come from performance fullness doesn't come from performance meaningfulness comes from giving ourselves to something beyond ourselves a a, a, a bigger uh, i don't want to say a bigger purpose but a bigger idea or bigger concept right um I think something like relationships speaks to that. This idea of I am here because I want to contribute to a community. I want to contribute to the people around me. I want to have phenomenal interrelational skills, uh, um, maybe not skills, um, experience with the people around me. And I'm here to add to that. And I think if you do things in the right spirit, that is the way to enhance that. Where if you come from the wrong spirit, that is like you said, I think it's a, surefire way to break those relationships and pull them apart and actually make them not successful. Um, it's an easy way to, to measure, right? Then is to say, well, how's the relationships in our organization? CEO go and, you know, everybody likes him. No, he's an absolute arsehole. Well, then that's a problem based on our conversation, right? Um, 
Axel, I want to thank you, right? I think, um, I think this has been a, a very cool little conversation of the series of, of spirited, I know we called it spirited cricket, but maybe we should have called it spirited sport or um, a slightly better, better angle on it. But hey, right? It's that it, we're speaking to the essence and the nature of, of things actually enhance performance by tapping into something that nobody's really tapping into at this point in time. Yeah. Yeah, Jody, I just, you just reminded me of something in ending. You know, we spoke about it in the first session and it would be nice to coin it off again at the back end. Yeah. What you just referred to there were those relationships. Uh, you know, this is all about the comparison or how symbiotically these things work together between lust and just. You know, we're constantly going between because we will just or lust after certain things and justice will come through the relationship, bring us back to our core essence. You know, stop, get you upside your head in a way and remind you of what's important in life, right? If you keep pursuing these things. So that's what it kind of works out. So, but the main thing about relationships, particularly within sport or even in society and life as a whole, what it does is if you have relationship based as looking for a recipient to add life to, right? You're looking for a recipient as opposed to a source, then you are going to be of pure spirit. And that's the objective here. We are trying to say, look for a recipient to share life with. Don't look to be a source as in trying to get something from, right? Because then you're going to lose your way and keep contributing, keep adding value one to another. And that's the beauty of what the spirit offers us and reminds us and brings us back to those relationships, which inevitably is what we live for what I can give, not what I can get. Thank you very much. Uh, I, I love this conversation. I'll chat with you soon again. Cheers.